Good morning. We thank the Lord for this, the Lord's day. It's a privilege to be alive today. It's a privilege to come into the presence of God, our Savior. We thank the Lord Jesus Christ, that is King of the universe. And we come today because we have been moved by Him. Today, the sermon title is The Name of Jesus. The Name of Jesus. It is Sermon 61, the penultimate sermon in our long series on the book of Revelation. Our scripture reading today is taken from Revelation 22. We just got two verses, verses 16 and 17, reading from the English Standard Version, the ESV, as read by Tatum Thomas. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let the one who hears say, Come, and let the one who is thirsty come, let the one who desires take the water of life without price. Let us thank the Lord for the reading of the word. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your precious word and the reading of your word this morning in public. We praise you and worship you that you will speak to us for a few minutes concerning the meaning of this word. And Lord, give us your presence so that we can go to the nations. In Jesus' name, Amen. The early church couldn't get away from the majesty of the name of Jesus. As the title is, the name of Jesus is the title of this sermon today. Great memories came to them after the Holy Spirit made Jesus real in the new dispensation that began at Pentecost. They were proud to be called by the name of Jesus. The following hymn, very early in my life, had begun to have a special place in my life. Oh, how I love the Savior's name. The first verse goes like this. There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in mine ear. The sweetest name on earth. And the chorus goes, Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. And the second verse, it tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. And the third verse, it tells me what my Father hath in store for every day. And though I tread a darksome path, yields sunshine all the way. And the fourth verse, it tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe, who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. I wish today we could have such deep words that could be written in modern composers and hymn writers. And in light of this, my three points this morning are 
the identity of Jesus, the invitation of the Spirit, and the heartbeat of the Bride. I'm eager to speak of the identity of Christ Jesus this morning. Don Fortner brings out four aspects to the name of Jesus in his book, Discovering Christ in Revelation. I want to expand on that, looking at the opening verse, which is 17. We see four realities that have invaded this world. The name of Jesus. The title. The root of David. The offspring of David. And the glory of the bright and morning star. When the name of Jesus is said even at this juncture in the book of Revelation, as we come to an end, we would have expected to see the kind of titles to validate our use of them. But what do we see? We see not just the humility of just his first name, but we see the humiliation attached to it. When this name was first announced, it was in the context of the sins of the world, Matthew 1.21. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. What is the implication? Jesus has not absconded his mission. He is still saving people from their sins. He is still delivering people. He, God himself, came as a man. He emptied himself. Yes, he emptied himself to reach you and me, to reach us. But when he died, he was clothed as both God and man. God and man. Next, the second thing. The title of the root of David. What is that? We know that when we speak of David, we know of his royalty his kingship. But who is the very root? Who is the very source? Who is the very cause of David's existence even before his royalty? Jesus the Christ. David's earthly kingdom depicted the eternal kingdom of Jesus. And through Jesus is David eternally secure. Through Jesus are you eternally secure if you are hid in Christ. Jesus is both a father and a son to David. Oh, he's a father and a son to you today. And the next thing we see, the third thing, the offspring of David. What is that? And this means that Jesus chose David's lineage so that he is the rightful heir. Oh, friends, he chose David's lineage, the lineage of a man. And Paul in Romans 1, 5 tells us that Jesus came from the seed of or offspring of David. What benefit has that given us? It has given us the benefit of grace and truth. Grace and truth. The name of Jesus unites God and man. And this union has been designed to be an unbreakable bond. You cannot break this bond. 
And fourthly, on this point, in the first point, the glory of the bright and morning star. What do we understand by this? Isn't he the star that was prophesied to come out of Jacob in Numbers 24, 16 and 17 by reference? So why is he the bright and morning star here? Well, the morning star announces and opens up the day. It opens up the dawn of the day. Let's go to memory lane, friends. Do you remember that time in Genesis 28 when Jesus, in his pre-incarnation, was wrestling with Jacob, whose name became Israel, and he became the progenitor of Israel, which to us is the church of which you are part. What actually happened there? Jesus opened heaven for Jacob. He announced and he, and he opened a new day a new dawn, the rising of a new day after this world comes to an end for you and me. We, as Jacobs, he opens heaven for us. Oh, oh, he saves us. Oh, that is why when Israel is in its mature state of growth, she still referred to as Jacob. And he saved Jacob. He saves us, Jacob. And he will save us, Jacob. And he will perform it for the new day to dawn at his second coming. Now for my second point, the invitation of the Spirit. The invitation of the Spirit. What do we know as the work of the Holy Spirit? John the Baptist said that when Jesus shall come, he will baptize with the fire and Holy Spirit. We know that this happened on the day of Pentecost. Did you know that it happened on that day? It happened on that day that we were baptized with fire and Holy Spirit. And Jesus also said that when the Spirit comes, he will testify of me. So who is the baptizer? Jesus is the baptizer. He baptizes you into his body, the church. And the Spirit says in 17, the first part, 17a, in our reading today, the Spirit says, come and let the one who hears say, come, come. There are two ideas which means to come. And let's settle the first idea. This idea is not talking to unbelievers to come, but talking to Christ. It's talking to Christ. And this means that believers who are assured are saying, Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. And the scripture says, Let the one who hears, these are the ones who are prepared. These are the ones who are ready. Are you prepared? Are you ready? They are ever praying, ever studying the scriptures, ever relying on Christ, leaning on Christ, depending on Christ. And the phrase, let the one who desires, look, look at your Bible, the one who desires, show those who do not desire. It shows those who do not desire. And in light of this, 2 Thessalonians 5, sorry, 2 Thessalonians 7, 10 comes into view. And what does it say? The Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven 
with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the very presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might when he comes on that day. While believers are looking forward to this day, unbelievers are not looking forward to this day. Ask yourself right now where you stand. Are you looking forward to this day? Are you looking forward to this day? What do we make of this, even with those who do not desire and are warned? There is an invitation to them. Oh, my friends, there is an invitation to them. There is an invitation to them. And that is the second idea. Those believers who say, come, is a constant reminder for the unbelievers to come. Oh, there are many, many unbelievers mixed up with believers. And there is water of life here without price. Without price, verse 17c, the third portion of verse 17, without price. And here is an evangelistic call, an evangelistic call. Charles Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers, Spurgeon was a Victorian preacher. He alludes to this being the whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. The whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Oh, but he is a very poor man, a very ignorant man, a very bad man. What of it? Does he trust Christ? If he be willing to take the water of life, then let him come and take the water of life freely. Oh, let those who don't know him come. The Spirit conquers the heart of people and effectually calls them to Christ. When we preach, the Holy Spirit is pleading with the souls of people. He arrests and he compels them to come to Christ. This is more than an arrest. It is more than an invitation. This is not the eagles of the Roman flag. This is the eagle of heaven. This is the eagle of heaven's grace that is landing. The eagle has landed. The grace of God has landed. The peace of God has landed. Come! And this grace is like a mighty operation in motion. It's like an engine that is in motion. God is at work. God is calling people to himself. And this firstly bombards the soul. It softens the hardness of the human heart. And then only do we feel the tenderness of of the love of Christ. He's first got to take all that stuff out, all the hardness, all the stuff that is rocky and coming in the way to soften us. Oh, oh, but it is a spirit's doing. Only he can make you willing to come to Christ. Psalm 110.3. Only he can make you willing. Are you willing this morning? Are you willing? Are you willing? And this leads me to my third and final point. The heartbeat of the bride. Wait is the heartbeat of the bride. We already alluded to this. And she is the church that is waiting for Christ to come. Oh, oh, oh. Right here in our text we read this. The spirit and the bride say, come. The Spirit and the Bride. The Church says, come. If you're in that position, blessed are you. Can you see the oneness here? All the things of this life that hold you back. All the things of this life that you 
that you enthralled with oh have you thought about how enthralled you are with jesus oh my friends what a oneness to be enthralled and to be taken by jesus to be assured of your salvation the bride is in tune oh are you singing in tune with him in tune with the spirit and in tune with the spirit for christ to come i say let our expectation of the coming of the lord jesus create an invitation for the unbelievers to come that's why get used to the word come it's a powerful word come because you want the unbelievers to come what are some of the hindrances that blocks this invitation many of the end time preachers are so enamored and so immersed with prophecy and its interpretations that they have forgotten to evangelize the lost says joel beaky they are so taken by speculation and and even interpretation and prophecy that they have forgotten to evangelize the lost oh church you are the lamb's wife you are the bride of christ you have been overwhelmingly blessed oh my friends aren't you anxious to ignite a delight to all a delight for all to come for all to know of your blessedness especially the unbelievers or oh, are you so selfish that you keep it to yourself are you so busy that you keep it to yourself are you so busy that you can't even tell in one second someone with a would 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 an expression an idiomatic expression if you may or a situational expression you know in passing so that it's an invitation that you can share christ are you so busy or you none of these if you're so busy you none of these and i tell you today who's fooling who who's fooling who who's playing church oh you have been filled to the brim with joy and understanding oh oh you've been filled with knowledge of god you've been filled with bible studies you've been filled with catechism you've been filled with the majesty of the glory of the music and the expressions of it and and knowledge and power oh 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 won't you want others to also experience what you've experienced oh oh won't you want others to come uh, oh aren't you feeling a tenderness for people being lost and and going away from christ and i ask you this question who is crying out in the song of songs in 14 draw after me or draw me after you sorry draw me after you let us run let us run i was driving this morning and i and i used another word instead of saying let us drive fast i, I reckon while driving let us run fast remember that i said let us run fast draw me after you let us run the king has brought me into his chambers <laughs> the king this is the context of song of songs the king the bridegroom has brought me into his chambers and this means the church is crying draw me <laughs> draw me i will not be content to come alone the church plural is crying the church as a collective is crying not me myself and i but the church us draw me draw me let us run i will not be content to come alone 
Every generation should witness the church doing this. The church wants to bring those who are far away close to Christ, where you are. I'd like to echo the heartbeat of Dan Fortner to show how the church must feel for the lost. Come like the leper in submission. Come like the woman with the issue of blood. Come in desperation. Come like blind Bartimaeus in earnest. Come like the gathering demoniac, naked and vile. Come like Zacchaeus, the tax collector, a sinner needing mercy. Come like the confessing thief on the cross to be remembered. Come like the adulterous woman with all your accusers. O oh, soul, people, people, people of the earth, come to Jesus. There is a name I love to hear. The sweetest name on earth. Jesus! The only Savior who is able to save to the utmost and to the guttermost. As God's law is a solid rock, so Jesus has been smitten by the rod of God's law. As God poured out waters from the rock, he pours out waters of free salvation for thirsty sinners in this parched and thirsty land. And this is an unsealed fountain. That's the glory of today's message. An unsealed fountain. It is wide open. You don't have to travel land and sea on a journey of religious confusion to end up twice a son, a son of hell. When God cut a covenant with Abraham, he opened this free fountain. What a stream. What a gushing stream. When Christ was hanging on the cross, he opened this fountain. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. I'd like to sing that hymn one day. When Christ flew open the grave, he opened this fountain. When Christ ascended into heaven, he opened this fountain. When Christ answers your prayers in his session right now, he opens this fountain. Are you sick? Are you confused? Are you disappointed? He opens the fountain. Are you all mixed up, man? Are you all trembling? Are you all alone? Oh, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Oh, that you would come and drink from this fountain today. Oh, that we had the custom of the saintly evangelist, George Woodfield. Whenever he did know what next to say, he would say and he would cry out, Come to Jesus! And then he would raise his hands and tears would come streaming down his face, pleading with sinners to come. The Spirit would make them come and they came by the hundreds and the thousands. They came in droves. They were ordinary working class people. They were miners from Bristol, England. They were housewives 
and this reminds me, a man came from Bristol, England, to South Africa, Pastor J. F. Rowlands. In 1935, he founded Bethesda Temple, and my father, my father of Hindu Telugu custom, became a Christian in a family of over ten brothers, and they all followed suit, converted under the ministry of Pastor J. F. Rowlands. Many Indians came by the hundreds and the thousands to Christ. The name of Jesus is still heard in the evangelistic preaching of those who know the meaning of come. Let's stand for the benediction today. And now may the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us today, this week ahead, until the end of the age. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening to this sermon. If you wish to hear more from Trevor Thomas, please like and share this video. Make sure to subscribe to the channel Apostolic Witness and to turn on the notification bell. May the Lord bless and keep you.